All right, um, I think we should get started now. I'm Arthur. I'm uh, organizing the this, this meetup. Uh, there's Nick, who's bringing the food. He'll be at the back. Um, hey, Nick. This is Ryan Garrett, who's giving us a talk on elliptic curve, curve cryptography in Lisp. Uh, and he has an extra surprise on the side <laughs> at some point. Yep. Um, so please. So just a quick survey before I start. Uh, how many people here have no background whatsoever in cryptography? OK. Uh, all right, so, so this, this talk is really for you. Um, and, and that's why it's a very brief and superficial introduction to elliptic curves, which are the latest and greatest thing in cryptography. Uh, they're really conceptually very simple. And that's what this talk is really about, trying to uh, take you from zero understanding to kind of a general understanding of the simple underlying uh, concepts. Um, you won't get to the point where you will be a crypto expert. There are a lot of details still. Uh, but the underlying concepts are really not that scary and intimidating, even though if you go and look at papers, the notation can make it look that way. Um, so the basics of cryptography, there are really uh, there are two kinds of cryptography. There's symmetric key cryptography, where you use the same key for encrypting and decrypting things. And that is used for uh, situations like encrypting data on your disk where you don't want to transmit that information to anybody. You just want to keep it secret. So there's all this, the person doing the encrypting is the same person who's doing the decrypting. And so you generate a random key, and you keep that key secret, and you don't try uh, to transmit that to anybody. And that mostly works. Um, it's got very solid theoretical foundations. It's secure against quantum cryptography. Uh, it's, it's really not that interesting from a technological point of view. It's, at, at this point, one could say it's a solved problem. Uh, even though there's still research being done in it. Um, but from an application's point of view, the current state of the art is good enough and will continue to be good enough for the foreseeable future. Uh, the problems start when you want to try to transmit encrypted information to somebody else. Because now you have two people who have to be able to have the key that was used that, uh, to, to encrypt this data. Um, and the problem is that if you don't have a secure channel over which you can send sensitive information so that you need to encrypt it in the first place, then you don't have a secure channel over which you can send a key. And the way that that problem is solved is through public key cryptography, and in particular, an algorithm called Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange. And Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange is a way that two parties can agree on a secret random key um, by doing this exchange protocol without an eavesdropper being able to figure out what that random number is. And the best way to illustrate that is with this conceptual uh, process involving paint. Um, so Alice and Bob start out with a common color, the yellow color at the top. And that's public. Everybody knows what that is. And each one of them secretly chooses a secret color. And Alice is going to choose this orange color. And Bob's going to choose this sort of uh, greenish blue color. Uh, and they're going to mix it with the common yellow color to get a combination of the common color and their secret color, which they then exchange over some public channel that, it, that anybody can eavesdrop on so that, uh, do I have a pointer? No, I don't. Does anybody have a pointer I could borrow? OK, I'll, I'll try to continue while the, oh, thank you. OK, so Alice mixes yellow and orange to get this, whatever this color is, sends it over a snoopable channel to Bob. Bob does the same thing with the common yellow and his secret color to get this color, which he then sends to Alice. Each one of them then mixes the color that they got from the other one with their own secret color. So what each one of them has done is mixed yellow with their secret color and the other person's secret color to get the same three color mixture at the end. Uh, but somebody who's been snooping on this public channel can't do that because they don't have access to the secret colors. They only have these mixtures. And this works because once you've mixed a paint, you can't take it apart anymore. So this, the mixing of the paint is a one-way operation that can't be undone. So that's really what public key cryptography and, and public key key exchange is all about. And we can abstract this mathematically um, by letting uh, BP be a, a base point, or in this case, it's a base paint. Um, SKA and SKB are the two secret colors or secret keys that Alice and Bob 
choose, and then the, the public key for Alice or Bob, which I'll denote with an X, is the base point or the base paint composed with some abstract operation uh, with that person's secret key. And in the case of paints, that abstract operation is physically mixing the paints. And in the case of public key cryptography, it is something else which I'll describe to you in just a second. But then the encryption key that they use, the common secret key, then is just the public key, each person's own public key mixed with the other person, sorry, the other person's public key mixed in with their own secret key. And if you just do this elementary, uh, it's basically elementary arithmetic, both of these, no matter how you substitute x and y, the result is that it's the base point abstract operation with one person's secret key, abstract operation with the second secret key. And this works to exchange secret keys as long as we have three conditions met. The first is that this operation has to be associative and commutative. And the second is that it has to be hard to invert. So as long as we can come up with an abstract mathematical operation that meets these requirements, then we can conduct this protocol. Um, the classic way to do this is with the classic Diffie-Hellman uh, protocol, which uses a math, a, an abstract operation called modular exponentiation, where this is defined as uh, x raised to the power of y modulo some large prime number p. And there are efficient ways to compute this. And even though the actual value of this is huge, that because you're taking it modulo p, um, that you can uh, uh, use a, an algorithm called uh, double and add, where you take, do a modular reduction at every step and keep the numbers relatively small. And so you can do this efficiently. Um, and when you do it, uh, when you, when, if you do regular exponentiation, then you can invert that by taking a logarithm. But when you do a modular exponentiation, the corresponding inversion is called a discrete logarithm, and that is an unsolved problem. And there are reasons to believe that it's, it's an inherently hard problem that doesn't actually have a solution. But proving it has to do with proving that p equals np, and that's like the most notoriously hard problem in all of mathematics. So it's probably unlikely that we'll actually have a proof of any of this anytime soon. But we have good reason to believe that this is all going to be secure. Where it breaks down is in implementation detail. So uh, for example, there, there are actually two known attacks against classic Diffie-Hellman. And I just mentioned this as an aside. Don't worry too much about this. One was called the Freak Attack, which was last uh, uh, published last year in March. Um, and the logjam attack, both of which were basically the same thing, is an attack on the protocol where, because there are different details of the ways that you can implement this, um, and in practice, this is a protocol that's conducted between browsers and websites when you go to an HTTPS website, they have to negotiate what prime number to use. And because you could force certain browsers to downgrade to export grade cryptography and force them to use small primes, you could actually break this. Um, and there's also a pre-computation attack. If everybody uses the same prime, then if you're the NSA and you have a huge bank of computers, you can do some pre-computation that lets you actually solve the discrete logarithm for a particular prime p. And this, this has not actually been observed in the wild, but it's a theoretical possibility. Um, and there are also some implementations of Diffie-Hellman out there in the wild that turns out to use p's that aren't prime. And those are just trivial to break. Um, so elliptic curve, yes? Is there also a man in the middle attack that you can make? These are all man in the middle attacks. Right. Right. So, what, so a man in the middle pretends to be the server and pretends to not know how to implement the protocol with a large prime. And therefore, if it's talking to a vulnerable browser, the browser will say, OK, I'll agree to use this weaker prime on the assumption that nobody's actually trying to break it. But in fact, it's talking to a man in the middle trying to break it. And that's how you break it. So elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman is exactly the same thing, except that modular exponentiation is replaced with a mathematical operation called modular elliptic curve addition. Um, and the main advantage to this is that the numbers are smaller because the operation is slightly more complex. So what I'm going to do now is explain to you what modular elliptic curve point addition is. And then you will know everything there is to know about elliptic curve cryptography, not really. So an elliptic curve, uh, first of all, has nothing whatsoever to do with ellipses. Um, the, uh, this is the formula that defines an elliptic curve. And 
it looks a little bit weird, but it's really just high school algebra. This piece of it is exactly the quadratic equation that you learned to solve in, um, uh, in high school algebra. And so you just make this, this a little bit more complicated by adding this x cubed term and making this y squared over here instead of y. And the reason for the, using this formula is basically this is the simplest formula that you can use where the resulting problem doesn't have a known solution. If you just made it a cubic, then there's a, there's a, a closed form solution to that. Um, and uh, so you add the square here, and it turns out when you add the square, mathematicians can't figure it out. That's the reason for this weird formula. And this is just what that, the graph of that looks like for various values of A and B and C. They, uh, you will notice that they're all symmetric about the, um, uh, the x-axis, and that's because if you solve for y, then y is the square root of this quantity, and the square root is positive and negative solution. So it's all, all, all elliptic curves are always symmetric about the x-axis. Um, so what point addition is, is you, want to, you have a point on this curve here, p and q, uh, and you want to, we want to define an operation that we're going to call addition. And the reason we're going to call it addition is because we want it to have all of the properties that addition has when we're adding regular old numbers, commutative and associative, and has an, ident an additive identity, and, and every number has an additive inverse that when you add gives you the identity. Um, that's why we're going to call this addition. And the way that it works is you draw a line through P and Q. And an interesting property of elliptic curves is that any time you draw a line between two points on the curve, that line is guaranteed to intersect the curve in exactly one other point. It's just a nice, handy bit of trivia about elliptic curves. And that fact allows us to define point addition in this way. So we take that third point reflected about the x-axis, and that we're going to define as the sum. So why this weird random reflection about the x-axis? Because that's the thing that lets, makes this operation behave in this nice way that gives it all the properties that we want from addition. So for example, we want to be able to take uh, this point P and subtract it from P plus Q, and we want the result of that to be Q, right? Just like we would have with numbers. So the way we define the additive inverse is just by reflection about the x-axis. So I should have made a slide for this. I'm sorry I didn't. Um, so if we define negative p to be up here and add it to p plus q, then we would have this line going this way, which would be the exact mirror image of this line. And so the intersection of it would be down here. And then when we reflect that about the x-axis to get the sum, we end up back here at q, which is exactly what we want. Ah, very good point. So what happens if we add a point to its own additive inverse? So if we add r to negative r to negative r, what the result should be zero, right? Except that this vertical line doesn't actually intersect the point, the curve. That's the one exception is a, ver a completely vertical line will not ex intersect the curve at a third point. So what we do, what mathematicians do, is they arbitrarily define that the curve has this extra point called the pointed infinity, which is the additive identity. And the way that they, that seems a little bit random, but there's actually a nice way to justify it. And the way they justify it is by imagining that this curve is not actually living in a flat Cartesian plane, but in a different, is embedded in a different algebraic space called the projective plane. And a projective plane is basically the surface of a sphere where the origin is at one pole and the pointed infinity is at the other pole. So imagine this plane wrapped around a basketball so that by the time you get to infinity, all the points of infinity have kind of uh, uh, conceptually congealed at the other end. Um, that's where you get the pointed infinity. And the pointed infinity is the additive identity, which is to say zero. So it gets a little bit weird. If you actually go read papers, sometimes you'll see the pointed infinity written as the infinity symbol, and sometimes you'll see it written as zero, which gets a little bit weird, but now you understand why. Uh, anyway, uh, there's another interesting case, which is if you want to add a point to itself, how do you, um, uh, you can't, you know, we now don't have two uh, points to define a line, so what we do instead is take the limiting case as 
as we're adding two points and one point gets closer and closer and closer, the limiting case is that the line is the tangent, the line that's tangent to the curve. And so if we want to double a, add a point to itself, which is called point doubling, we do the same thing except the line is the tangent line to the curve at that point. So we follow it till we find the one other intersection and then reflect it about the x-axis. So this point here, q, is 2p. Um, so that's what point, uh, what elliptic curve point operations look like geometrically. Uh, mathematically, uh, it's, it's just elementary high school uh, um, algebraic geometry. So you take, you compute lambda as the slope of the curve. It's just the difference of y divided by the, the difference of x. And then, uh, so the point at y is just lambda times the difference in the, 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 the difference in x between the two points minus y0. Um, this formula is a little bit harder to get out of. You have to bring the actual formula for the curve into it, but it's elementary algebra. I'm not going to waste time going through it. If you're really interested, you can read the Wikipedia article. But it's all high school algebra. Um, so how we make this suitable for cryptography now is we turn this continuous elliptic curve that that is defined over real numbers into what's called a discrete modular elliptic curve by doing all the exact same math except over a finite modular field, which is to say we're going to take only those points on the curve whose solutions are integers, and we're going to do all the math modulo some large prime number p. And when you do that, you end up with something that looks like this. Um, every point here is a point where that original curve intersected, had, had an integral solution, and then everything sort of shrunk back into a small space by doing everything modulo p. And point addition works exactly the same way. It, you, to add p and q, you draw a line, and you track that line, except the line now kind of goes this way, because every time it hits p, it drops back down to 0, because you're doing everything modulo p, until you hit another point that is defined, that has integral solutions, reflect that about the x-axis, this particular, uh, when you do everything modulo p, all of the points that used to be negative get reflected back up here. So the line of symmetry is now here. You see how everything down here is the same as everything up here? So the reflection is now done over that line of symmetry, but it's the same thing. Um, so the discrete log problem, on, on, on discrete elliptic curves, we can now efficiently add. It's just going through that elementary high school algebra. We can multiply, efficiently multiply using the double and add algorithm. Um, we can efficiently divide, too. That's a little bit trickier. That involves computing a multiplicative inverse modulo p, but there is a very clever algorithm to do that called the extended Euclidean algorithm. And we can even take square roots which involves an even more clever algorithm called the Tonelli-Shanks algorithm. Um, but the thing we can't do is find, efficiently, is find discrete logarithms. So given a base point and some, the result of multiplying that base point by some large integer n, we can't find n except through exhaustive search. It's actually not quite true. There are slightly more efficient algorithms than just exhaustive search, but we can't do it efficiently. So this is what is called by term of art a hard problem the sort of hard problem that you can base um, a cryptographic scheme on. Why isn't that divide? Excuse me? Why isn't that the divide problem? Is it efficient? Oh. Uh, yeah, because um, that's a very good question. Uh, And it's. Well, no, it's it's because what you're multiplying here are not two numbers, um, and so you're multiplying a number by a point. So what this really is is you're taking this point and adding it to itself, and a, a very large integral number of times. Um, and because of that, this operation does not have the same symmetry that multiplying two numbers together has. And because of that, it can't be inverted by multiplying again by the multiplicative inverse of n. And that, so 
it happens to be true for numbers that if you take n times m times the, multiplic times the multiplicative inverse of n, that you end up with m. It's not true for elliptic curves. Um, but, it, but, but, but the details of why that is are more subtle than I can really ad lib here. So if you really want to dive into those details, catch me after the talk. <clears throat> Uh, there are some more non-trivial issues. Um, it's, it's not enough that this problem be hard in general. We also have to be sure that for the particular parameters that we're selecting, that we have what's called a, a, uh, a very large group so that the a very large number of points that, are, that you can possibly get to so that we ensure that a simple brute force search will not find the answer efficiently. So uh, we need to, for a given base point in a given curve, we need to know how many points are out there. And we can't just count them because the whole assumption is that uh, there are too many to, to search efficiently by brute force. And it turns out that there is an efficient algorithm for computing how many there are, even though we can't count them, called Schuf's algorithm. And this is a very nice example of a problem that's hard to find the answer, but easy uh, to verify that the answer is the right answer because we just multiply any point on that we multiply the base point by that number and see if we get back to the base point, right? Um, and then the, also, the other question is, can we actually find a suitable base point that actually generates when we add it to itself repeatedly, actually gets you to all these points on the curve? And the answer to that turns out also to be yes, using a sophisticated mathematical result called Lagr Lagrange's theorem, which I mentioned only if you're interested in diving into the hairy details to tell you what to look up None of this matters if you want to use elliptic curves in practice. Um, oh, there's more. Uh, there's a real rabbit hole here if you want to get into elliptic curve research and design. Uh, there are actually different kinds of, ed of elliptic curves. There are Edward curves and Weierstrass curves and Hessian curves. Uh, projective coordinates, which I've already mentioned, which actually let you do all the math more efficiently. There are some of these operations that are expensive, in particular, Computing square roots and multiplicative inverses are is very expensive, um, and so if you do a coordinate, if you do basically a, a change of variables, a coordinate transform, then you have to do fewer of those operations, and everything becomes faster. There, if you're going to use them for cryptography, you have to worry about side channel attacks, things like timing and power consumption. You can actually, if you uh, are able to measure those things, you can actually get the secret keys out if you're not careful. So designing algorithms in such a way that they're not vulnerable to those is tricky. Um, and, uh, uh, and making everything run fast. Um, ignore this for a second. Uh, this actually belongs in a later slide. Um, there's actually one known instance of a real world attack based on very clever selection of, of curve parameters um, so that the problem becomes easy if you know what the trick is. Uh, it was called um, dual ECDRBG, which was a random number generator based on elliptic curves that was designed by the NSA in 2004 that included some really weird looking constants that got everybody kind of suspicious and made them think that there might be a back door in there somewhere. But it wasn't really confirmed until the Snowden leaks in 2013. So that's the kind of thing that if you're going to design elliptic curves, you have to, that's the reason you need to take a deep dive into the rabbit hole if you want to design these things. If you don't care about designing them and you just want to use them, then here's all you need to know. There's this curve out there called Curve 25519, which was designed by a fellow named Dan Bernstein, uh, who is invariably known in the crypto community as DJB. You may have heard of him. He was also the, uh, um, the author of QMail. And it's, again, very simple. This is the, the equation for the curve. It has this kind of weird looking number in it, um, but it turns out that it's not that weird. The way you get this number is you make a long list of all the known attacks against elliptic curves, and you start with the simplest curve that you can where all these numbers are one, and you start incrementing this until you get to the smallest number where this curve is secure against all the known attacks, and that turns out to be it. Uh, then you need to pick a prime number p, and the prime number is 2 to the 255th minus, 200, 2 to the 255th power minus 19, 
which again seems a little bit weird and random, but there's a good reason for this. Um, this is the reason, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, it turns out that th when you define the curve in this way, um, there is a generator that generates a group of this size, um, 2 to the 252 plus this weird number. Uh, and the generator is the point with, uh, whose x-coordinate is 9, which is the smallest x-coordinate where that you actually get a generator for this group. Uh, so why this weird prime? Because if you want to do uh, math modulo some large prime number p, it turns out that there's a clever hack that lets you do it much more efficiently than just actually computing the dividing by p in the general case. If the prime number has, this, uh, has a form of 2 to some power minus some small number, and this is the clever hack, which is that n modulo this prime, if this number is small, or a prime of this form, is the number basically right shifted by k bits plus, oh, sorry, not right shift. Yeah. This is the right shifted by k bits times the small number plus masked by uh, 2 to the k minus 1. And that's it. So instead of having to divide this huge number, you can split it into two pieces and do two, these two much less expensive operations on it, add them together to get the result. That's the reason for this prime. This is the, this is the smallest prime number less than 2 to the 256. Yep? What power is that really long well number of 2 plus 2? This? 252. Which, which number are you talking about? Oh, so this is not a power of 2. I know, but what's it close to? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> but it doesn't really matter. That, because what matters is that this, this is the number of points on the curve. And what matters is that this is a big number. What, what matters is that it's bigger than 2 to the 250th, which is the thing that makes it infeasible to crack this by brute force. So I only put this here just as a, a bit of trivia, because it's kind of interesting that we actually can figure out what the exact number is, and you can verify that this is the right answer. I just thought it was kind of cool, but th this, this, this number is actually completely, the actual value of this number is completely irrelevant. Yeah? <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's odd. It can't be exactly. No, it's not, it's not exact. I mean, if you, are, you just type this number into your Lisp interpreter and print it out in hex, and you'll see it, it has a, a, the, the structure when it's printed in binary is it's a 1 followed by a bunch of zeros followed by a bunch of random bits. But that just, just happens to be what it works out to. Uh, that's it. Um, so let me give you a little... So, that, so this is a Lisp group, so I, I have to tie this back to Lisp somehow. So here is an implementation of uh, elliptic curves in Common Lisp. And when you implement elliptic curves in Common Lisp, you can do all kinds of cool and interesting things. Um, so let's see. Uh, some of you have seen this. If you've seen previous talks of mine, I have... A, uh, an infix parser that I use to do things like let me find some infix code. <laughs> yeah, so here is remember I said you do these coordinate transformations, you get more efficient algorithms for adding um, uh, for adding points on a curve. This is one of those algorithms, and it. Um, it kind of sort of looks like Lisp up here because it starts with. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, can you really not see that? I mean, there's still seats up here, so there's no excuse for you to be that far back. Anyway, there's a defund. There, there's an open paren in column zero, which is kind of a hint that it, that it's Lisp. But then in here, uh, you see things that kind of look like C, and. Uh, and they're all wrapped up inside this, 
this mod p thing. And the way this works is uh, mod, well, so there are two kind of cute, tricky things going on here. The first is that the way that the infix parser is embedded into common Lisp is that anything that is a symbol followed by a open paren with no intervening white space invokes the infix parser. So that's sort of the, the, the slot into the common Lisp syntax space where I, where I squoze the thing, um, which I think is kind of nice because it lets you it lets you write infix in a way that's kind of seamless. There's no hashtag i weirdnesses to scare away C programmers. So this was designed so that if you want to bring a C programmer into the com into the Lisp fold, you can show them this, and it kind of it kind of looks warm and fuzzy and familiar to them. And then the second thing is that this mod p thing is a macro. And let me show you the definition of mod p. That's here. And I'll unhighlight it so that you can see. It wraps the, this expression, this expression, in an flat that redefines all the basic math operations to be their modular equivalents. And that's all it does. So now what you can if you go down here to the code, you can now write math over modular field simply by wrapping infix expressions in mod p. And if you just say mod p open paren, then you get your, in, your infix parser for free. So, hmm? Where is p defined? Uh, p is a global constant in this code, which is a really, really bad idea um, when I this, this code has evolved over a period of many years. And when I started writing it, it was, it was just sort of a throwaway hack. And all of the crypto literature just uses P as the prime that you're doing everything modulo. So that's what I started using. By the time I realized it was a bad idea, the amount of work it would have taken to go back and change all that is more than I've ever been willing to do on any given day, even though it's high on my list of things to do to go back and fix this, because it really is a problem. But yeah, P is P is the curve two five five one nine prime, which actually I could just show it. Oh yeah, so that's two five five two to the two fifty fifth minus nineteen. Um, the more interesting one. Let's see if I remember what I called it. Yeah, L. L is the um, that weird constant, the the order of the curve. So it's one followed by a bunch of zeros followed by that weird number that just happens to be the answer that drops out. Um, so other things we can do since we're in Lisp. Um, this is still, I have kind of an obsession with making code as clean and easy to read and easy to write as possible because I'm lazy and I don't want to have to do any more work than I have to. Yeah, in the back. A threading macro? What do you mean by a? Well, closure has a bunch of threading macros where you take the value of the previous expression and oh. operator either in the first place or the last place and continue on that. Yeah. Um, let me show you what I'm about to show you and see if that answers your question. And if it doesn't, you can ask it again. <clears throat> uh, so anytime I see a block of code that has a bunch of things repeated, I, I, I cast a jaundice eye on that and say, is there any way that I can get rid of that repetition? I hate repetition. Because that's, you know, that's boring grunt work that compilers ought to be doing for us and, and that I shouldn't have to be spending my mental energy on. So, um, so what I really want to be able to do is, is embed information about the kinds of operations um, that I want to be able to do on a mathematical entity into the mathematical entity itself. So conceptually, I want to say that I have a data type, which is an integer modulo some prime number p. And I want to be able to add that to another instance of the same data type and have them know that the way, have the compiler know that the way that I add integers modulo p is to add them and then take the result modulo p. Um, and we can actually do that in common Lisp because common Lisp has generic functions. It's a little bit tricky to do that for basic arithmetic because the basic arithmetic operations are not generic functions. 
uh, but we can shadow, we can create our own package and shadow symbols. So what we can do is shadow all of our basic math symbols and unbind them so that we can redefine them and then define methods for addition, multiplication, subtraction, division, and so on and so forth. And the reason I'm calling these by words like add and mull is because I want to, main, I want to be able to maintain, to make this look like I'm still in common list. And in common list, all of the basic mathematical operations take arbitrary numbers of arguments. And what they do depends a little bit on how many arguments you pass in. So, and I don't want to have to define generic functions on arbitrary numbers of arguments. I just wanted to be able to define the generic functions pairwise and have some wrapper function that handles the multiple argument case in general. And so that's done here. So I'm going to redefine plus to reduce the arguments using the add generic function. And same thing for multiplication. And for subtraction and division, I have to have this special case because they do different things depending on whether I'm passing in one argument or multiple arguments. Um, but so now I have basically reinvented, redefined all my basic math so that it still does what it did before. But now I can define methods on these. So I can define a class find my class here. Uh, yeah, so I've defined a class called a modular integer, whoops, which has two slots, the value and the prime. It doesn't actually have to be a prime, but in cryptography it always is, um, that it's going to do its math modulo. And so I have a function mod i. So let's take um, 123 modulo 1021. Uh, cause 1021 is the smallest prime smaller than 1024, which is a nice number for doing demos with, cause it's big enough to be interesting and small enough that it's, that the numbers are still kind of tractable in your head. And now we have this value that prints itself out as 123 modulo 121. And I can multiply that by itself. And that's, that's the result. And we can verify that that's the case by taking 123 times 123 modulo 1021 and we get the regular integer. So now we can just do modular arithmetic on modular integers without having to think about it at all. We just write regular common list. And as long as we have the right data structures, the right data types, they carry that information through with, through these operations with them. Um, what happens if I try to add a integer modulo 1021 and one modulo 1022 say. Well, that's an error. So now there's a certain class of error that I can no longer make, right? I can't accidentally take something modulo the wrong thing. Uh, whoops, you're right. Mod I. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so there's the correct error. So it's telling me I can't add modular integers in different bases. So there is now a class of error that I have completely eliminated as long as I adhere to a certain coding discipline. Uh, what else can I show you? Um, how are we doing for time? Okay, I think I'll stop there. I actually have some more uh, demos um, to kind of demonstrate how elliptic curves work. There's have a, sort of a generic elliptic curve class that lets you explore with fiddling with the, the parameters and a, um, the results of adding points, but um, I'll just show that to you. Catch me after the talk if you're really interested. I have one other cool thing to share, which um, uh, because this is a list group, um, one of the uh, um, concerns that you always have when you're dealing with cryptography is where do you store your keys? And in particular, if you want to do crypto on your laptop and your laptop is potentially compromised by an attacker, then there's no place you can put your keys because any place that you put your keys that you can read, an attacker who's owned your machine can also read. So 
The solution to that is this little gadget, which is a, a USB dongle that has a little ARM processor on it. And it does all the same crypto operations that are being done here. And it also has a, rand a harder random number generator on it and some non-volatile storage. So you can generate keys on here and do crypto operations using those keys, but you can't get the keys out. That's not the interesting part for this group. The interesting part for this group is that the processor that I chose for this happens to have a megabyte of flash on it, and it still only costs 10 bucks. Um, and because it has a megabyte of flash on it, I can do this. So I'm now talking to this gadget, and to convince you that I'm talking to it, I'm going to unplug it, and you'll see that, it's dis that it disconnects. So that's the proof that I'm re really telling you the truth when I claim that I am now talking to this gadget. Um, here is an, an example of it doing one of these. Well, that's interesting. Oh. The, um, the reason this is interesting is because you'll notice that the random seed that was used to generate all these keys is not very random. So somewhere along the line during my development, my seed um, store got erased, and I don't know when that happened. Not a, I mean, this is a develop machine. It doesn't matter. The keys weren't important. But anytime something happens in cryptography that you weren't expecting, that's a big yellow flag that you need to figure out. Um, if the attacker owns the machine, can't they uh, mock the USB device and, like, send you fake keys? No, because the keys are actually generated on board. The Wait, but how do you Yeah, that's a very good question, and the answer is beyond the scope of this talk, but catch me after I, I'll answer that. Uh, the, the short version is that the answer to that question, there is an answer to that question, it's not currently implemented, um, and that's not what I wanted to really talk about anyway. What I want to talk, show you here is, now remember, this, this is now, we're now talking to this little gadget that fits in your pocket. Um, how many of you recognize this prompt? Uh, it's running tiny scheme. <laughs> so <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, probably. I mean, a meg is a lot. Um, you know, my first computer in college was a Mac Plus with a meg of RAM, and it ran Coral Common Lisp. So, my my dream is actually <laughs> to run Coral Common Lisp on one of these gadgets. You can already run Closure Common Lisp, which is what Coral Common Lisp eventually evolved into on a Raspberry Pi. So um, the, the limiting factor here is RAM. It only has 32K of RAM, which is really, really limiting for running Lisp. And in fact, even getting Tiny Scheme to run on it was a bit of a challenge. Um, but you know, if, you, if you really wanted to, you could, out, you could add a gig of RAM in, to this thing for another five bucks, and then it would be a complete no-brainer. It's just computing hardware is unfreaking believable nowadays what you can do with it. Yeah? I'm curious about the uh, way the fund methods Yep. Uh, and you define them in terms of uh, rest cards. Um, is the compiler good enough to eliminate uh, the construction of the argument lists there? Or is that not uh, insignificant compared to the modular operations? Um, yeah, so the question was, in the way that I've implemented the generic arithmetic operations, um, is the expense of, cons of constructing the rest arg argument lists significant uh, compared to the expense of actually doing the modular arithmetic? The answer is I have no idea. I haven't run any benchmarks. Um, this whole, that whole demo is something I just threw together this morning on a whim. 
um, just so I could have something cool to show to a Lisp audience. Um, but it's not something that I'm actually using. Well, so if you were really doing this for, for real, real, you'd probably want to do this as compiler macros rather than generic functions. Um, but I am not proficient, I'm not wise in the ways of the compiler macros, so I would have a learning curve to climb if I were gonna do it that way. And I have other fish to fry right now, so that's why I didn't do it that way. But if somebody really wanted to do this, it, it's very doable. Oh, I have one more question in the back. Sorry. So let me try to paraphrase your question and see if I got it right. Um, in general, it's with all of the things that could possibly go wrong, why do I believe that this is really going to be secure? Is that a Yeah. Um, so first of all, I don't use the FIPS curve parameters. That's one of the reasons. <laughs> I, I, use, I use curve 25519. Uh, because it's, it, it, of all of the curve designs that are out there, it seems the least hinky to me. And it's gotten a huge amount of scrutiny at this point. And if, had, if it had a problem, almost certainly somebody would have published that by now. Because whoever finds a weakness in curve 25519 will have their academic careers made. Um, excuse me? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah, the comment was you never, never miss a chance to prove Dan Bernstein wrong because those opportunities come along only very rarely. Um, so, so that's why I put my trust in curve 25519. But the, the, the more general question is a very, very good question and is actually the question that is driving my entire effort, which is, if somebody hands you a gadget and claims that the gadget is secure, how can you convince yourself that their claim is, that, that, that you should trust their claim? And that is a very, very hard question to answer, um, which is why I believe that trying to find an answer is potentially lucrative, which is why I'm spending all my time on it. Okay.